Good evening, everybody. I'm Rabia Akhtar, Director, Center for Security, Strategy, and Policy Research at University of Lahore. Today, we'll be talking to the authors of uh, this newly uh, launched report. Actually, it came out in November 2020 by the British American Security Information Council, BASIC, UK, in collaboration with the Institute of Conflict, Cooperation, and Security, ICCS, at University of Birmingham, UK. And the report is titled Nuclear Responsibilities, A New Approach Towards Thinking and Talking About Nuclear Weapons. Uh, we have shared the link on our social media. So uh, please do uh, read uh, this report. It's uh, extremely exciting and interesting. But before uh, we begin our conversation, let me introduce the co-authors. Uh, I have with me uh, Sebastian Brixey Williams, uh, who is the co-director of BASIC and the director of the program on nuclear responsibilities, which he co-founded in 2016. He's a nuclear weapons policy specialist and conflict mediator, and he uses track 1.5 dialogues to open up new possibilities for building trust and cooperation among states and non-governmental stakeholders. Uh, we also have with us uh, Nicholas J. Wheeler. He's a professor of international relations in the Department of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Birmingham and academic lead of the program on nuclear responsibilities. His, uh, he has several publications to his credit. He was appointed uh, as the first director of the newly created Institute for Conflict, Cooperation and Security at the University of Birmingham in 2012, and he served in this role uh, for uh, the first eight years. So good evening, Sebastian and Nicholas. Thank you so much uh, for being here with me today. Thanks so much for having us on the program, Rabia. Yeah. It's, Thank it's you. really good to see you again, and, and great to have an opportunity to talk about something that we, um, that we feel so passionately about. Absolutely. Uh, so the format, will be, uh, the format will be that I'll ask a couple of questions regarding this report, and I uh, would want that to be your introduction and report's introduction to the Pakistani audience and all those who are listening to us. Um, so with, with this, my first question to you, uh, and I would appreciate if you could take turns, you know, answering that and chip in as you like. Uh, please introduce your project of nuclear responsibilities and tell us what are the main takeaways for an audience in Pakistan that is unfamiliar with this literature. So over to you, Sebastian, and then to Nicholas. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, so in the last sort of five years or so, uh, basic in the ICCS's work in this area um, has been exploring how to foster a culture of responsibility in the heart of global nuclear politics. So we've had this hypothesis that if we can help generate a strong and shared culture of thinking and talking about responsibilities in relation to nuclear weapons, um, this will help reduce distrust. Um, it will help reduce misperceptions um, and it'll also help overall reducing instabilities and risks. So the basis of that hypothesis is that thinking and talking about nuclear responsibilities enables better policymaking, um, which takes different responsibilities into account and helps balance them um, in, a, in a more balanced way. Um, it builds shared understanding, um, both within the states, but also um, between states um, that can help, um, you know, generate a better, better understanding of each other's perceptions of each other's policies and practices, and, and in doing so producing um, greater predictability. Um, but ultimately, um, finally, you know, talking about these things with others helps outline the boundaries of what we think of as acceptable behavior. Um, and really, um, you know, the, I think the, the biggest benefit of that is it, it's, it helps stigmatize the most egregious and dangerous behaviors. So we develop through talking about responsibilities and, and getting to under, understand sort of how each other thinks about these things, we can develop a new shared understandings about what, what is acceptable behavior and what's not acceptable behavior. And so what we've been trying to do is to create a vocabulary uh, and a framework for having that discussion um, that helps people um, get over the tendency that we see at the moment to talk past one, one another um, and to fall back into claims about who is responsible and who's not responsible, um, which ends up in a kind of mutually hurting blame game that actually doesn't take the conversation any further. Um, so what we did over 2018 to 2020 specifically uh, was we tested that out with a series of roundtables and we went to five different kinds of state. Um, we, uh, we went to the UK, which was a, a nuclear weapon state, obviously. 
um, and which has been very supportive of this work. Um, we went to the Netherlands, which is a non-nuclear weapon state within NATO, um, and to Japan, which is uh, a non-nuclear weapon state outside NATO, but which falls under the nuclear umbrella. And then we went to um, Malaysia, uh, which is a state within the NAM and uh, you know, a supporter of the, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and also to Brazil, which is also a, a TPNW supporter and actually one of the six states that led that initiative. And so what we thought was if we could test this idea out with um, a range of states who have different views on the legitimacy of nuclear weapons, um, then what we might be able to do is, you know, see whether this is going to fly, basically, um, you know, testing it with a cross section and, and then extrapolating outwards. Um, and that led to the report uh, that you've mentioned, um, Nuclear Responsibilities, which came out in November last year. And, and that report really explained some of the motivations behind this approach and the literature behind it, because we, you know, we didn't come up with all of this alone. We're standing on the shoulders of many um, excellent scholars. Um, and some of the key ideas, um, and ultimately what we call the nuclear responsibilities approach, which tries to encapsulate a lot of those ideas in uh, a central place. Um, and obviously, you know, you and I, Ravi, I got talking sort of not long after that report had come out. Um, and what we're going to do now is, um, in the next couple of months, is publish um, the nuclear responsibilities toolkit. Um, and the idea is that uh, that toolkit will transfer a lot of the kind of conceptual work that you see in the report into a very practical document um, that anybody can pick up and use um, to, uh, to sort of oversee a thinking process about nuclear responsibilities, um, to talk to others about nuclear responsibilities and, you know, be aware of some of the, uh, the opportunities, but also the pitfalls that, that can happen when you try and have that kind of conversation. Um, and also the, um, the opportunities that can come from writing about this theme and, and some of the work that's already come out um, that I, I think does that very well. Um, so to sum up what I've said so far, you know, basically what we've what we've designed is a new approach. It's a, it's a new approach uh, that, that reframes how we think and talk about nuclear weapons. And it's one that places a holistic and systematic consideration of responsibilities um, at the center of our mindsets and also at the center of our engagements with others. Um, now for us, adopting a nuclear responsibilities approach means reflecting on and adapting both how we frame policies and practices at the conceptual level, um, but also the rhetoric we use to frame dialogue at the national and the international level. And it means shifting the touchstone away from the kind of standard of inquiry of, um, is this in my interests or uh, does this satisfy my rights? Um, which can get very fractious if you have competing rights claims towards the question of, well, what are my responsibilities and, and how am I implementing them? Um, so what we're hoping, you know, overall is that this can offer a new kind of language that can help transcend um, the culture of blame that we see within the, uh, within global nuclear politics, um, which is, you know, to our, you know, to our minds at least, a big part of the reason that um, the risk reduction and disarmament agendas um, have been stalled. Um, it's because we don't have a dialogue that works. And what we're trying to do is offer a way of, of having a better dialogue. Um, Nick, do you want to just say a few, a few more words about this? Um, yeah, um, maybe just a couple of points. Um, I mean, I guess the first one is that I want to just emphasize what um, Sebastian said about this importance of reaching out to all perspectives in the debate. Um, we're not trying to establish a new normative approach to uh, how you should think about responsibilities. We're not trying to say that this is the right way to think about responsibilities and this is the wrong way to think about it. We're not trying to propose a particular agenda, whether that's, for example, you know, promoting the treaty, uh, prohibiting nuclear weapons, or whether it's no first use, or whether it's, you know, enhanced counterforce policies for dealing with, you know, uh, adversary states. We're not trying in this program to uh, present a particular normative position. Those people involved in the program, of course, their own uh, individual normative positions. And of course, you know, we, uh, we welcome that in the debate and everything. But th what the program's trying to do is to establish a new way of thinking and talking about nuclear weapons that can be open to all 
uh, participants in the global nuclear debate or stakeholders in the global nuclear debate. And from that vantage point then to look for the possibilities of developing a new constructive dialogue that can reduce uh, distrust in relationships where that's prevalent and open up new pathways to trust. And I think that's the real difference between what we're doing with this idea of, of uh, responsibilities in relation to nuclear weapons compared to what kind of maybe other approaches in the, um, in the past. And we're anchoring that firmly to a dialogical perspective where we want to bring people together to have that conversation. All right, excellent. Um, thank you for this overview. Um, would you like to talk a bit about the process that it entails, the critical introspection and the empathic dialogue? And why do you think, uh, why are you hopeful, I should say, uh, that nuclear weapon states would find your process workable and would want to talk to each other and not uh, continue on with this, you know, uh, Conveniency that they have developed uh, by blaming each other because they get away with so much by blaming. Uh, and there's so much uh, that they get to achieve at the end of the day with some achieving the moral high ground and the others losing it. Uh, so why do you think they would listen to you or any of the nine nuclear weapon states listen to you? Well, this is good because it gives me a, a very nice opportunity to preview um, the, the Nuclear Responsibilities Toolkit that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, what that document's um, going to do is, is um, it explains the key concepts and then it's set out in three main sections. So we've called them uh, thinking about nuclear responsibilities, talking about nuclear responsibilities and writing about nuclear responsibilities. Um, now, in the thinking about nuclear responsibilities, uh, what we what we outline is a responsibilities framework, um, and actually, this is something that you could that is broader than nuclear weapons. You can use this to think about all sorts of things. You could think about space responsibilities or cyber responsibilities uh, as well, or you could think about something totally different, you know, outside of the security realm if you wanted to. It's been deliberately designed to be relatively generic, um, but in the context that we're using it, um, the purpose of that framework is to enable uh, an individual or a group to think about their responsibilities in relation to nuclear weapons very holistically and very systematically, and then to identify potential um, uh, conflicts between their implementation um, and the assumptions within their thinking, uh, and then think of the ways that they can be, they can be overcome. Um, so that's going to be coming out uh, in, in the next couple of months, as I say. Um, the framework has 12 questions that work in order. Um, and uh, it's designed to be a creative and, and playful thing uh, that you can play with. So that's thinking. Um, now onto talking, which is kind of what, more what you asked about. Um, we designed, uh, actually it was a two part process in the report and actually we've expanded it in the toolkit and we've called it um, now a three part dialogical process. Um, and these three parts are um, firstly familiarization. Um, so um, sort of gentle, uh, side of this is getting people just used to the concepts, um, seeding the ideas, letting people feel comfortable with them. Um, and only when you've kind of done that within a given community do you then start thinking about the second part, uh, which, which we've called collective introspection. And that's when you bring people from a community together to talk to each other um, about their perceptions. So they may have each been through uh, the framework on their own, and actually that's quite a useful way of doing it. And then what they do is they come together and they, they do the framework together and they, they see where their um, opinions may, dif may differ. And then when you've done that at the national level, you do that again in, in different countries and you bring all of those groups together for the third stage, which is multi-stakeholder dialogue. So what, what we are aiming to do is to have um, a very meaningful conversation at the national level where people have really thought these things through before they come together at the international level um, and can have, uh, you know, a more informed conversation there. Um, now, why should they do it? <laughs> I suppose that's the, the, the wider question is, is why engage in dialogue at all? Um, and, uh, you know, we have seen evidence that some, some countries are not particularly interested in dialogue at the moment in general. Um, and so it may be that this falls at the same um, pitfalls that other approaches to dialogue take. Um, I suppose that's the pessimist's answer. And it may well be that people come to the dialogue and they don't engage in good faith. And, and that's another pessimist's answer. 
in a way, you have to assume, I think, that people do engage in good faith, uh, while always being alert to the, the risks of lying and, and um, you know, time wasting, I suppose. Um, but I think the maybe the slightly more optimistic answer, or, or realistic answer at least, is, you know, people don't necessarily have the vocabulary to have this kind of conversation at the moment. Um, they, it's, it's not to say they're not capable of having it, um, but they just maybe never thought about it. They, you know, we're not sort of trained to think about policy in exactly this way. There's, there are traditions within in international relations which tell us how to approach problems. And what we're, what we're presenting is an alternative way of approaching the issue. Um, and what we've tried to do is to make that fun um, so that it's not a burden um, to have to go through this process. And we tried also to draw attention to the fact that um, you, know, you can get insights and clarity out of doing this process on your own um, just as much as you might get out of um, doing this with other people. And so if anything, you know, you know, we, we hope very much that it will be a benefit to you if you take part, not just, you know, it's not something that benefits us particularly as such, you know, it, it obviously one hopes it benefits global security in the long run, but actually it's something that's aimed at individuals, whether they're policymakers, um, trying to think about how to shape policy uh, within a given country, um, or whether they are um, scholars, you know, think tankers, researchers, academics, thinking about, um, you know, the country they're living in's policies and, and how to interpret them. Um, or whether you're a member of the general public and you want to get a bit more engaged in, in these things too, you know, it's kind of something for everyone. Um, and it's, uh, it's an adaptable tool. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's experimental. And so we have to put it out there and we go and talk to people and we see whether they like it. Um, and, um, you know, one hopes very much they find it useful. All right, thank you. Um, so when we got, you know, introduced to each other and you uh, wanted me to, you know, look at this project and, you know, contribute something or at least think about it. Uh, the first question that came to my mind was, how do you uh, sell constructivism to uh, realists? And that brings me to India and Pakistan question specifically, because uh, both India and Pakistan do hardcore realism and when it comes to nuclear weapons. And so talking about norms, values, responsibilities, you know, both countries uh, have time and again, ever since they revert nuclearization, called themselves as responsible nuclear weapon states. So you taking a project like this to India and Pakistan and, and bringing their experts on board, uh, how do you uh, convince uh, both countries to look at nuclear responsibilities approach? Um, you've talked about in your introduction that you know you do not want countries to uh, do the blame game, call themselves responsible in relationship to others being irresponsible. What is it exactly that you mean by it? And also Nicholas mentioned in his introduction as to what is it that you guys are not looking at in terms of responsibilities. So would you want to narrow it down and tell us what is it that you are looking at which constitutes responsibilities or falls under the framework of it? Like one, two, three, you know, what is it to the point? So over to you. Yeah, okay. So to take the IR question first, um, you know, I, I actually think that the, what, we, what we've offered is, is something that actually realists can engage with. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because realists understand themselves to have responsibilities. Um, just like constructivists, just like liberals, whatever. Um, everybody contains, you know, every, everybody's positions hold implicit understandings of responsibility. And those are things that we bring personally, or we might bring institutionally. Um, we may not be wholly aware of them. You know, there may be things that were laid down in childhood <laughs> that, we, that we don't think about very much, but they are there. Um, and part of the kind of intention of the approach is to try and bring those things to the conscious mind from, from the unconscious and to put them on a table. So where, when I say that I, it's relevant to, to realists, I mean it. And I think um, what it can do is provide a language that, uh, that realists and constructivists, for example, because you mentioned those two schools, can use to talk to one another 
um, in a way, actually, at the moment, they don't really. You know, but we start from these positions of being in very different schools, um, of having totally different perspectives and, and really um, if you're not this ism you're that ism and um, and you know I'm not really very interested in your opinion um, uh, the principles behind the approach is actually you know it's based on active listening it's based on curiosity it's based on empathy for one another's positions um, it's based on openness pluralism uh, a willingness to understand that people understand things differently um, and it's saying that actually if we're going to you know um, manage uh, a nuclear weapons program uh, or the nuclear threat more generally well then it, it pays to bring lots of different perspectives into the room and to have them have a productive dialogue <laughs> it's back online um sorry <laughs> wi-fi dropped i'm so sorry that's all right <laughs> um i hope it won't do that again sorry no problem okay. i was just uh Responding to the question about um, uh, realism and, and constructivism. Um, All right. me, I would like to have heard that question. <laughs> well, Rabia, maybe you can remind me what the question, the second part of the question was as well. So <clears throat> the second part was as to, you know, why should India and Pakistan listen to a constructivist dialogue when they are very much comfortable in their own skins? Uh, calling themselves responsible nuclear weapon states. And this actually ties into what I, you know, had asked earlier as well, uh, you know, have the countries of the first nuclear age and the second nuclear age uh, engaged with your process, your work differently? Um, have you uh, received any criticism of your work? Um, or, or, you know, some, some value addition that these states, you have taken this work to have come back and said that, yes, you know, this is some framework that we can work with. So, so because this uh, conversation is to serve as a, an entry point into, uh, you know, uh, the discourse on nuclear weapons and responsibility, which is non-existent in India and Pakistan, uh, but in their own minds, they have their own frameworks of responsibility and what falls into that. So from that perspective, you know, how much of you know, overlap do you see? And, and do you have the ground from where you, you can stand on and then build from there? You know, it's not entirely non-existent, but it might not be in tune with what you see as nuclear responsibility. So, so both challenges and opportunities with respect to India and Pakistan and how they look at nuclear weapons. Mm. So yeah, yeah, I think the, I, oh, go on, Nick. Well, I, sorry, I mean, apologies, uh, 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 listeners uh, and viewers, but, but my, my Wi-Fi dropped, so, but I, I wanted to, I don't know if you continued, Seb, to make this, this point, but I wanted to pick up, uh, if I could, uh, Rabia, and I'll try and then segue into that as a general thing. When you were asking, you know, um, how do you um, get this approach, uh, you know, adopted by, uh, you know, the existing nuclear possessors? Um, I mean, I think, you know, that is a really important question. And I think Seb was answering it, you know, at multiple different levels saying, you know, it might be that, you know, a particular policymaker reads the report and now the toolkit and, and is persuaded and starts to think about these things or a group of policymakers, you know, more hopefully, uh, or maybe just, you know, someone who's very interested in global nuclear politics, you know, uh, um, uh, um, among the wider public and so on. Um, and I think that's absolutely right. You know, that's the power of the approach that it, that it can make that, that appeal to, to multiple uh, uh, constituencies or stakeholders. But I think also what we've done so far uh, is, uh, and what I think we want to very much do taking this project forward as, as, as basic and ICCS, is to try and develop a form of controlled communication that builds on the track to problem solving approaches to, to, to conflict resolution, developed you know, principally by people like John Burton and, and Herbert Kalman and so on. Um, and in, in the region by Peter Jones and, uh, and many others. But rather than focusing it on a specific conflict, like for example, Kashmir or um, um, confidence and security building measures 
um, in, in relation to a particular kind of kind of issue area, we, we, we want to bring that kind of approach to bear around a question of responsibilities. So that so and that I think is very different to what's been done before. And so then the question becomes, uh, picking up where I came back into the conversation, how do you persuade people that are, shall we say, comfortable or to use your kind of language of, you know, um, uh, in a uh, mindset you want to distrust because they because that gives them, a, you know, if we're going to use some international relations kind of sort of uh, theory kind of uh, um, approach here, you know, uh, the ontological security of feeling um, secure in that way of thinking about the world. How, how does one then start to open up the possibility that actually there might be a different way of doing this? There might be a way of coming into a dialogue where you actually start to see the other in a different way. Now, we're not, we're not trying to uh, prejudge that and say that you will necessarily see the other in a different way, but we're trying to open up a space where you might be open to recognizing that how you see the other <laughs> Uh, is quite different to how the other uh, sees itself. Um, and how you see yourself is quite different to how the other sees you. And so beginning the possibility of an empathic connection. And we think that the, that the problem solving workshop approach where you get people who are open to the possibility that distrust might not be the only game in town, that there might be other ways of loosening that distrust, of reducing it. And at the very least of gaining a better understanding of one another. I mean, in relation to that question of, you know, why people in the region should take the approach seriously to reduce the risks of miscalculation, to increase the risks of mutual comprehension, sorry, to reduce the risks of misunderstanding and increase the possibility of mutual comprehension, which means that in a crisis situation, which, you know, unfortunately there, were, there have been, you know, a number in the region uh, between India and Pakistan and so on. And to try and think then about how in a crisis situation, better understanding of how each side understands their responsibilities and thinks about the other's responsibilities and a better empathy for that might actually reduce the risks of miscalculation uh, and the risks of uh, inadvertent escalation. So from this, uh, before, before I come to you, Sebastian, if you want to add something to it, uh, Nicholas, you talked about uh, you know, escalation during crisis. So India and Pakistan, and I've written it at several occasions, have outsourced their escalation control to third parties like the United States mm -hmm. comes in and pulls them apart and tells them to calm down and takes charge of escalation, you know, uh, controls escalation for them. Would you count that as irresponsible nuclear behavior where you have outsourced escalation control to a third party and you continue to experiment uh, below uh, a certain threshold, keep provoking each other to see where the red lines lie would that, is that something that would fall under uh, the irresponsible nuclear behavior or how would you look at it? Well, I think that what I was trying to say at the beginning is that what we want to avoid on the program is falling into the trap okay. of attributing responsibility and irresponsibility to particular actors. So it's, I wouldn't want to, as part of the program, to in terms of thinking about the approach and what we're trying to do. But what I would want to do is explore through the track to problem solving route. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've been interested in in my own work over the years, as you, as you, as you probably know, is trying to apply the critical or history method to uh, conflict resolution. And I've been, been involved in some work on this in relation to why Brazil and Argentina didn't develop nuclear weapons. We actually pursued the first real case study of a case, uh, using the critical war history method, bringing back together participants in the drama at the time with our, an enormous amount of archival material 
and trying to understand why was it that Brazil and Argentina didn't develop nuclear weapons in the late 1970s and early 1980s. And one of the things that kind of remains a sort of project that I would like to pursue in the future at some point would be to do something like this in the India-Pakistan context. I mean, I've done a lot of work on the Lahore uh, peace process and the Cargill War, um, my own work in the book I published in 2018, Trusting Enemies, and bringing together people to talk about that would be extremely interesting. And the um, what I think I'm saying is that if we want to understand whether escalatory policies are responsible or irresponsible, we need to get the actors in the room who are part of that, in part to, to explore what, what they were thinking at the time, how they understood their responsibilities, how they interpreted the others, and be and to be able to then test that against the others in the room saying, well, actually, no, we saw it differently, uh, and so on. And that then starts to open up a space where you can think about, well, actually, what might have been a better way of managing escalation in this crisis? And by talking about responsibilities and by talking about the possibility of shared responsibilities, that you can start to see how policies in then might be thought about in the present that might then help us forward. So we can see how using this kind of retrospective thinking and looking back could be really helpful in opening up these possibilities. But also one of the things that Sebastian and I have talked about is the possibility of kind of role play simulations where you would bring people together in a secure, safe space to explore these kind of questions of escalation and crisis management and so on. And we think the responsibilities framework could be really important in opening up new ways of thinking about those problems that don't lead the actors themselves uh, to fall back into those comfortable kind of mindsets of distrust. And I mean, a key part of this is to promote this idea of um, what you know I've called in my work with, with Ken Booth, first of all, back in our 2008 book, The Security Dilemma, this concept of security dilemma sensibility, where you recognize that others might be behaving the way they are because they're fearful and insecure, uh, but also crucially, you recognize how your own actions have played a part in that fear and insecurity. And then from that, uh, moment of empathy, from that development of empathy, from that you then start to think about how you can reassure the other to that you that you are committed to policies of mutual security, how you can increase their security and do that in ways that doesn't decrease your security. So that I guess that's the constructivist answer to the structural realist kind of um, proposition is that there is space in an international anarchic system for for cooperation that can enhance both sides' security. Absolutely. Um, and that's what really fascinates me about this project. Uh, I hope that the people you bring on board ha are very high on EQ, because <laughs> otherwise, you know, if they lack EQ, uh, then, you know, it's, uh, you, you're bound to fall into the, pit, you know, the challenges that you uh, already have, you know, I'm sure thought of. Uh, when you will bring parties into a room and trying them to bring empathy there as well. Uh, Sebastian, I want to ask you, uh, so this is uh, uh, a 1.5 track um, initiative, but you at some point want to involve and take this to the policymakers as well, because you know, track two has relevance, but you know, it's it's efficacy. You know, in a charged environment, for example, uh, India and Pakistan today, where state-to-state -state dialogue is not happening, there's only so much that track 1.5 or even track two can accomplish. So, how do you propose to, um, or, or what is your appeal to policymakers? How can you involve policymakers of both these countries uh, to, or, or for example, Pakistan, because you know we're talking to a larger Pakistani audience. Uh, what is it that you would like to say to Pakistani policymakers and as to why should they think about nuclear responsibility differently uh, as compared to what they think of it now? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Well, I think, I think there's two main things. Um, the first one is, um, you know, Nick's already touched on it. That there are there are risks um, that are rising uh, between India and Pakistan, but also you know connected to other countries in that chain. 
um, and we don't have a clear understanding uh, between those countries of what, res what responsibilities they each have and how they're behaving. So in the, sh in the short term, there's a real important, uh, really important need to reduce crisis instability and create off ramps. And having a, a dialogue about responsibilities um, that's focused on, on those uh, aspects in particular, I think would be a very good step forward for that. You know, that, that, is, that is only going to be of benefit if something were to happen. Um, but then in the short to medium term, you know, as Nick said, there's, there's this need to reduce misunderstandings and misperceptions that could lead to that kind of crisis. And again, kind of embedding a conversation about responsibilities that gives you more context or for why people are behaving the way they behave. Um, we'll, we'll help you do that, uh, we hypothesize. Uh, you know, that's, that's what we've produced so far. Um, and then the long term, there's the need to, to transform the underlying drivers of those conflicts. Um, and that, I mean, that's a harder sell. You know, I fully appreciate that's a harder sell. Um, but you've got to start somewhere. And it's not, a, it's not impossible. Um, there's nothing intrinsically impossible about that proposition. Um, it's just something uh, that will take a very long time because, uh, because you're coming from such different places. Um, so that would be the first thing, you know, it, it's, it's, it's certainly experimental, it's worth it, but it's worth going. Um, the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, we hear from, from both India and Pakistan um, and the other nuclear, uh, nuclear possessor states outside of the NPT, you know, the sense that they're not kind of as involved in the creation of the norms um, because they're not part of the treaty. Um, and a sense that maybe that's not sustainable in the long term. So there's this challenge of engagement um, with the other nuclear weapon states. Now that doesn't mean that the risks have gone away. That just means that sort of in, in legal terms that, that they've not been recognized and, and you know, you're, you're well aware of this. Um, so, you know, the way I see it is that um, using responsibilities approach uh, enables a conversation uh, between the NPT nuclear weapon states recognized under the treaty and those states that come outside of the treaty, as well as the non-nuclear weapon states, of course, um, because it, rather than talking about obligations under the treaty, it enables a conversation about responsibilities and it enables a new kind of normative conversation um, that can create new, new normative understandings, um, which might be more relevant for today. So I think there, there's these two points. There's, there's kind of, it can help in terms of uh, risks uh, between countries related to Pakistan with India, um, but there's also uh, a new uh, possibility of engagement um, with, the, with states outside. Excellent. I, I, think what, I think what I would add to that, I think that's a great answer, but I think what I would add, just, just sort of add to that is it offers an opportunity to the responsibilities approach offers uh, a way into the, um, the security relationship between India and Pakistan, which is, it's a different pathway in. It doesn't, it doesn't involve political costs in the way that some of the pathways do, given where the situation is today. It's a way to come in to have a broader conversation about responsibilities. It doesn't commit you to any particular policy position or anything like that. It just gives you a safer way to begin to navigate the relationship. Now, how you make that appealing to top level policymakers, as Seb said, and you know, uh, your question implies, you know, Rabia, is, is, is very challenging. But it is, it is an opening and an opportunity for a conversation that, that isn't as politically charged. Now, I, we're not saying it wouldn't become political it could easily become politically charged of course but but it's a way in which is the starting point is very much looking at yourself it's not it's not addressing the problems of the other the, the irresponsibility of the other it starts with the self and trying to think about how the self understands its responsibilities and how it understands the responsibilities of others and then from there it, it opens up a way I think into a different type of conversation and what you're trying to do is give people an opportunity to test out um, how they really understand the conflict situation um, because you know one of the things that you know as I've kind of just alluded to that I'm very interested in and why I think this program is so you know for me personally has been such a you know a fascinating one to be part of and to to develop and is that 
it opens up a way of trying to develop that security dilemma sensibility, which is extremely rare, particularly in nuclear adversarial relationships, but it can develop. No, you only have to look at the end of the Cold War. You only have to look at what Reagan and Gorbachev were able to achieve. You know, in 1983, you know, at the height of the second Cold War, you know, with the Able Archer nuclear crisis in November 83, the Korean airliner being shot down you know, a couple of months earlier, um, you know, with the superpowers poised on the edge potentially of another fatal kind of, uh, you, know, you know, nuclear crisis, the nuclear crisis that could easily have escalated. You know, who would have predicted when Ronald Reagan called the Soviet Union the evil empire that, you know, two years, less than two, you know, two years later, just over two years later, he would be sitting down with Mikhail Gorbachev and beginning a process that would, you know, lead the superpowers away from the risks of nuclear conflict and towards a very different world. And so never say never in international politics. You know, that I think is the constructivist response coming back to that, to that point. And, and we think this, this approach does open up possibilities for giving decision makers the chance to test out whether the other party you know, is capable of exercising security dilemma sensibility, is looking to reassure uh, and for you yourself to also show that this is the way you want to take the relationship. Now, if, if that can be achieved over a long period of time in lots of different fora, if that way of thinking about international relations can become more prevalent in nuclear adversarial relationships, then you know, that will be a massive contribution. And if we can make a small uh, step towards that, supporting that work through this approach, then I think that's, that's something that you know, we hope very much that people within the region will want to get behind and support and take forward. I, I absolutely agree. It's a worthwhile exercise. It's just that, um, so I want to ask the second last question before I move to my last one. Um, so getting India and Pakistan in a room without China is not going to accomplish a whole lot because it's the whole uh, strategic chain thing. And you can't get China in a room unless you have US in the room. So, uh, so how would you uh, deal with bringing these parties together to generate security dilemma sensibilities um, among them? Uh, because I think that's a real challenge. Individually, uh, they might engage with you, but collectively, um, you know, they'll be vulnerable, they'll be open. Uh, their, uh, and that vulnerability, I don't know how they will deal with it. Uh, so have you, have you given it a thought as to, you know, how would you deal with these challenges? I think that, yeah, I mean, where we're starting, you know, I mentioned earlier, there are these, these three stages to the dialogue process. There's familiarization, there's collective introspection, and there's um, the multi-stakeholder dialogue, which brings everyone together. We're very much still in the familiarization phase at the moment. So we are, we are a little way off um, sort of bringing everyone together and, and, and doing, um, yeah, you know, following the formula that we, that we put together in, in the toolkit. Um, but this is, the, of course, a challenge that we, we will have to deal with as, as we go along and the sooner we start, the better. Now, you know, part of the conversations that we want to have in these kind of first couple of stages about it are, are about kind of who is in the room um, in the multi-stakeholder dialogue. And, uh, you know, we will be engaging with all three of the countries that you've mentioned and some others. Um, so, so we don't want to have a, a purely nuclear weapon state um, conversation um, f uh, because you can imagine, you know, that, that might actually just be more difficult to deal with. And, and actually there are very legitimate non-nuclear weapon state perspectives that should be taken into account as well. Um, so, you know, it's going to be a case, it's going to be different for each one of those states, how we how we kind of go about the familiarization process. Um, and we'll have to take it very slowly. Um, you know, if you're well aware, this is new. Um, it's going to probably be viewed with uh, at least a question mark over some people's heads, um, if not actual suspicion. Um, and that's fine. You know, it, that's the purpose of the familiarization stage is, is to sort of say, well, you know, it it's really non-threatening <laughs> we we really want to like impress that um and we're here to answer your questions and um and to talk about it until you basically feel comfortable um 
And, you know, we'll have to see how that goes in each one of those countries. And it may well be that um, some countries move faster than others. Um, and uh, it may be that some countries get there and some don't get there at all. Um, so it's, it's a bit difficult to give a sort of straight answer to your question, um, other than to say, you know, what we will be doing with each one of those countries is saying, we'd like to bring you together to talk to the other ones. And, um, uh, and there are good reasons for that. And, and the reasons um, perhaps that uh, you've had in the past for not wanting to do that, um, perhaps there are ways around that. Um, we're also gonna be starting very much at the track two level. Um, and there are certainly going to be individuals within each of those countries that I think will be willing to come together and, um, you know, will be creating something of an epistemic community uh, or community of practice um, that is transnational through those kinds of track two engagements um, that I think will build, um, build networks and will build, uh, you know, up to, in the slightly longer term, these official engagements. Um, because there will be people surrounding the governments who, who will have uh, experience of these kinds of dialogues and be able to give advice on kind of what to expect. Um, it's always tricky with policymakers because policymakers have a position. And so to get people into a room and, and to say, well, I want you to critically assess your own position, um, that's tough, um, that particularly, particularly tough if you're in a room with your counterpart from your adversary's country over the way. Um, so, you know, I think there also has to be a certain expectation that um, kind of the openness and flexibility of these conversations might well decrease as we get a bit further on, you know, from, from track two to track one, where the track two people may well be willing to think about these things in a really elastic way. And, and that's going to be very interesting. Um, but if you can get people, you know, if, if you can go through that process and, and report back to your national kind of constituencies and then get people from the official communities to come together um, and even be a little bit more elastic than they were before or even gain just a little bit more understanding than they had before from the other side that's still a win um, so it's it's not the case that uh, you know in order to be successful the a nuclear responsibilities dialogue needs to completely transform everybody's understanding and you all have to come away with with a wholly aligned um, set of beliefs about responsibilities you know that would it's obviously unreasonable and, and these sort of philosophical underpinnings of, of responsibility go very deep you know China has 5,000 years of philosophy that it, that it bases its, its own understandings of responsibilities on and, and those need to be understood very carefully um, but, it, but it is a way into a conversation um, and, and all of the experience that we've had so far with all of the states that we've engaged with and all of the sort of 50 plus conversations we've had with people across the Asia Pacific in the last um, six months have indicated that this is, you know, this is certainly a way into that mutual understanding. And so, you know, again, I think, it, I think it's always a case of, of just selling the benefits to the, to the end user, to, to those officials and saying, you know, at the very least, this will benefit your own understanding. Um, and you may not have come away with having negotiated anything as such, but you will, um, you will have a perspective uh, within government that will aid your analysis uh, and that will um, perhaps have given you some, some new contacts um, that you can, you can be in touch with should something happen. Um, and that's, yeah, that's, that's a benefit in its own right. So that, I guess that's what I'd say. Fair enough. Uh, this reminds me of a joke. Uh, how do porcupines make love? And the answer is really carefully. So <laughs> I think we need to go with that, you know, uh, and, and see as to how it goes when all of us are in the same room talking about responsibilities. Uh, this brings me to my last question. Um, how much of an impact have you had with your own government, uh, given that the UK has announced 40% increase in its nuclear arsenal? And how does that fit the responsibility framework? Because, you know, you coming uh, to South Asia and engaging uh, countries like India and Pakistan would first question coming to you is like, why does UK need nuclear weapons? You know, where, where do you go from there? So over to you for that. Sure. Well, um, so we're engaging in lots of directions at once, I would say. So it's, it, um... If we're engaging the UK, we're engaging France, we're engaging uh, in the Euro-Atlantic area as well as as well as the Asia Pacific at the moment. Um, we're slightly ahead on the Asia Pacific, but 
get that at least sort of is, is standing out. Um, it's hard to measure impact, you know, as you know. <laughs> um, I think we have had an impact at the very least in the UK at the rhetorical level. Um, and I think the behavior, you know, at the behavioral level, it's, it's going to remain to be seen um, and it's going to take a bit longer to verify. Um, Obviously, the UK uh, brought out its integrated security, um, uh, defence, international development, and foreign policy review um, in March. Um, so it's the first one since 2015, and it's been um, cited as sort of the most comprehensive uh, overhaul of our our security and defence work um, here for some time. Um, and and in that. Um, in the section on nuclear weapons, um, you do see language, uh, uh, the UK says it takes its responsibilities as a nuclear weapon state very seriously, um, and that, that language is new, and it moves away from previous language which says that the UK is a res responsible nuclear weapon state, um, and they very deliberately dropped that phrase. Um, uh, Sarah Price, who's the head of the Counter Proliferation and Arms Control Centre, um, stated that at our report launch in November last year. They very deliberately um, dropped that phrase because they felt it was counterproductive to the dialogue, um, particularly with non-nuclear weapon states, who, you know, many of whom will say, well, there's just no such thing. You cannot be a responsible nuclear weapon state. So this, this framing is a non-starter. Um, you also see uh, reference to wanting to engage uh, with, this, with the countries in South Asia about nuclear responsibilities in the integrated review. Uh, I think that's really interesting. It, you know, it sets a really clear intention um, and we'll obviously uh, be involved in that work and, and um, interested to see uh, in what other ways they, they want to, to do that. Um, and we've also heard that this kind of language, you know, runs through all sorts of internal documents. So it's not just an integrated review now, it, it's, it's gone right into the heart of Whitehall. Um, and one would expect the, the review conference national in implementation report that will be coming out in August, uh, if not sooner, to have this kind of language in there as well. So I think, I think we are seeing you know, the UK putting out feelers, at least, to become a normal entrepreneur for this kind of work. Um, I think they are trying to think introspectively, and I think they're, they're trying to promote this, this idea of, a, of, of, of nuclear responsibilities dialogue. Um, and I hope very much that they'll do that in a, in a kind of curious, uh, pluralistic, open way in, the, in, in, the, in accordance with the spirit of the approach. Um, but you're right, you know, nevertheless, how do you square that with the warhead increase, for example? It, it does sit quite uncomfortably, um, at least at first glance. And, uh, and it's not only the warhead increase, there's also a, this retrograde step on, on transparency. Um, so the UK has declared it's no longer given public figures on its operational stockpile, its, its deployed warhead or its deployed missile numbers. Now, if you ask someone from the UK, um, a UK official, I mean, um, they'd say a few things. They'd say, we have multiple responsibilities. Um, and the state, the protection of the state and the citizens of that state is the highest priority. So at the end of the day, um, servicing our deterrence requirements has to come first over all the other things. Um, they'd also say it's not illegal that um, the, the warhead cap has increased. And I, I would point out it's, it's, a, it's an increase in the cap rather than the warhead numbers specifically. Um, and for this, this figure of 40% has been um, has been put out. It may be less than that um, because actually the current or the last declared stockpile number was at 215, whereas the 40% the relies on um, the 180 total cap that um, was, was more of an intention for the mid 2020s. But, but nevertheless, nevertheless, you know, it still uh, looks an awful lot like an increase. Um, so they'd say it's not illegal. And, and in part, that would be uh, well, to a large extent, that would be because of the difference of interpretation between the UK and a lot of the non-nuclear weapon states about the exact obligation um, conferred on the nuclear weapon states, um, well, actually on, on all parties, under Article 6 um, of the NPT. Um, so the, the, uh, the nuclear weapon states hold the line that the obligation is only uh, that you need to pursue negotiations in good faith towards a disarmament, whereas the non-nuclear weapon states say, well, actually, that's uh, that's a misinterpretation. It, it is disarmament itself that is the obligation. So this is this is really interesting. And so if you have situations of vertical proliferation like this one, it is very much based on uh, this difference in interpretation. Um, they would say the warhead in increase is not as big as claimed. 
Um, and they would also say it's not all about warhead numbers. And, you know, they would point to um, the work the UK's done on nuclear disarmament verification, um, uh, the work they've done in counterproliferation, uh, the risk reduction contributions they've made within the P5 process, and, and so on. Um, now, nevertheless, <laughs> as we say, that's, it still sits a bit uncomfortably, right? And, um, and there have been people out there saying, you can't have it both ways. And I think that there's, there's something to be said for that. And so it's gonna be really on the UK to demonstrate um, that this is not just words, um, that there is also actions behind this that, that back it up. Um, now, we don't know what framework the UK used um, to think about these things. They didn't use our responsibility framework because it's only just coming out um, and we haven't shared it with you. So we can only kind of glean from um, analysis of past statements and that sort of thing, the way that the UK thinks about responsibilities. And, and chapter two of the, the report we mentioned at the beginning um, gives a bit of an overview of how, how this idea has, has kind of rolled along in British discourse. I think what we would want to see is on the public record, a statement about who or what the UK sees itself as having responsibilities towards, what those responsibilities are, and how those responsibilities are translated into policy and practice. And a nice clean line between these that makes a kind of explanation of the assumptions that were held uh, as you connect them up and the conflicts that exist between them and how you might mitigate them. And that's where the toolkit comes in. So this is the, the framework, that, um, the responsibilities framework within the toolkit that I mentioned at the beginning um, offers a way of doing that. And, and as facilitators, you know, we can come in and we can help um, with that process. Um, so we will be engaging the UK uh, with that framework and we'll be getting together officials and, and non-governmental experts to explore the UK's responsibilities and, and it's going to be very interesting to see whether the UK comes up with the same answers, <laughs> you know, having just been through this IR uh, integrated review process, if they now go through the responsibilities framework, um, you know, are there going to be uh, new beneficiaries of, of responsibilities that they didn't really consider very well or which got kind of sidelined? Um, that come up and actually um, uh, uh, get given more prominence and that sort of thing. I mean, it'll be really interesting to see. Um, yeah. Uh, Nicholas, do you have something to add? Well, I, sp I suppose, I mean, I think everything Seb said is, is very, uh, you know, persuasive and clear and a good explanation of, of UK, you know, official thinking and how we might kind of make sense of it. I mean, I was very struck by the language in the integrated review where the UK talks about the commitment to mutual risk reduction and uh, developing mutual trust and security. And of course, the challenge that, that Seb's opening up there is how well will the UK government be able to explain, uh, on the one hand, the uh, increase in the cap on nuclear warheads and the, uh, the, the change position on transparency alongside this commitment to, to building trust because with the non-nuclear weapon states, there may be a perceived erosion of trust uh, on the part of uh, their trust in the UK and you know, the trustworthiness of the UK in their eyes as a, uh, as a state that's committed to uh, the disarmament. So I think there is a trust building challenge there for the UK, undoubtedly. And I think it'll be very interesting to see how the UK um, develops its position there and indeed what it understands by developing mutual trust and security. So whether there will be new initiatives in particular, you know, it's interesting that South Asia does get an explicit mention in the integrated review, as Seb says. And, you know, obviously we're looking to work very closely, you know, uh, with, um, you know, the UK um, to, to explore how we can, you know, work together to take forward the responsibilities approach. But as Seb says, It'll be very interesting to see how the UK um, interprets the, the, the responsibilities approach as we've now developed it because it's gone through this, you know, evolution and development and so on. So that's going to be fascinating to see. And, we're, you know, we're looking forward to, to working, you know, with people in, um, in, 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 in the counter proliferation and arms control centre in particular to, to develop that. I mean, I think coming back to your, to your previous question, and I guess maybe this is kind of sort of, where I think that there's a really interesting role for the UK um, is that the UK is uh, uh, a prominent member of the P5 um, and it's, you know, it was the first 
member of the P5 to really develop that process through the, the P5 process and so on, which it started in, you know, in at the, the end of the um, uh, first decade of, the, the, of, of this century. Um, and, and it's very much committed to the P5 process. And I think the, the answer in a sense to the challenge that you posed to Seb and I in relation to the question of the triangular dialogue between India, uh, China and Pakistan is really that that probably needs to be something like a P5 plus two process. And that, that really is the challenge I think is if, if there's really going to be progress, then, then, and I think everything Seb said about starting familiarization, working up, all of that is absolutely important. So in not in any way jumping the gun here, but I guess if there's a long-term goal here, because I don't think the triangular process can work by itself for exactly the reason that you, you alluded to uh, in, your, in your question, Ravi. Mm -hmm. So that is, a, there's been obviously attempts at triangular dialogues and so on at different levels, but clearly that's never really taken off at the official level and you obviously you can understand why. So whereas the P5 plus two, that does open up a really interesting space, I think. Um, you know, there have been some attempts to explore these ideas before, you know, of course, there was the International Commission on Nuclear and Proliferation and Disarmament, which produced a very interesting report that I think has got a little bit buried in recent years, perhaps is worth resurfacing again. But, you know, they talked about the idea of a dialogue involving the eight. Um, and but 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 a P5 plus two, I think, process. And there, I think the UK has a really important role to play both for given its history and uh, given its experience uh, and, and given that he has this key role in the P5. And so I hope when they talk about mutual trust and security in the integrated review, that what they'll start to try and think about is how they can use the P5 process to energize the P5 into thinking about questions of nuclear responsibilities, but also reach out uh, and bring in India and Pakistan into that process. And what I think we would very much like to try and do on our program is support that process very much by working through the different levels that, that Seb's laid out there very clearly and which are laid out very well in the toolkit. Absolutely. Thanks. I think it's a very, very interesting point uh, of bringing UK into the mix and probably taking a lead role with India and Pakistan. And I, that makes me wonder as to why, you know, all these years, uh, UK's role has been eclipsed. Uh, overshadowed by the US uh, when UK, you know, has, uh, you know, both India and Pakistan have more of a, you know, baggage with the UK as compared to the US. So, so it should be interesting if this space is further explored. Mm -hmm. uh, but overall, fascinating. I, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, learning from you. I continue to, and uh, I look forward to engaging further with your project. Uh, and also uh, try and, uh, you know, start a discourse in Pakistan based on your report um, as to how does Pakistan look at the whole nuclear responsibilities framework and whether, you know, we at our end uh, in small pockets in academia and think tanks uh, can start the critical introspection uh, on our own before we get into a formal process uh, with you as a community. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for being here with me today. Uh, it, was, it was great talking to both of you and uh, I look forward to our future interactions on this subject. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It's great to talk to you too, Rabia. Thank you. Thanks Rabia, it's been really fun. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, take care, bye. Bye. Bye-bye.